Ravi Agrawal is a technical sourcing manager and he's part of the Facebook infrastructure group. And in Ravi's role, he's responsible for driving advanced packaging architectures and foundry for both networking and AIML compute applications to meet Facebook future workloads. He's driving the chiplet, chiplet business work stream in the open domain specific architecture sub project within the open compute project. And he's working with ecosystem partners to enable chiplet marketplace. And uh, prior to Facebook, Ravi spent 12 years at Intel Corporation and MCOR, and he received his PhD dual major in material science and engineering and polymer science from North Carolina State University and an MBA from the University of California, Berkeley. And Ravi has co-authored more than 20 journal and conference publications and holds six US patents. Ravi's going to talk to us today about metadata centers, heterogeneous integration driven by AI, ML, and network applications. Ravi, thanks very much. Over to you. Thanks, Rob. That was quite an introduction I have heard after a long time, but thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for investing your time and joining today's workshop and this talk. And I want to thank organizing committee for giving me this opportunity and inviting all the great speaker earlier today. So I think I learned a lot. And I'll be focusing today on uh, metadata center heterogeneous integration, uh, uh, which is primarily driven by AI, ML, and networking applications. So I have divided my talk into three parts. I'll talk about the heterogeneous integration uh, for AI ML application and in the networking space, some of the power challenges we are seeing and then uh, die disaggregation and the, some of the chiplet work we are driving internally and externally. In the first half of the talk, I will be focusing on AI ML application and how at Meta we are approaching these from a system level as well as from a rack level and how advanced packaging and interconnect can drive co-innovation for future technologies and platform solution. This is a view of a typical meta data center, which place to house all compute, storage, memory, and AI ML and video accelerator, which are all connected together with a network. So here we are showing types of workload meta deal with and their relative importance. Ranking and recommendation is most important workload. That's how we recommend to users when they interact with family of meta products. Computer vision and natural language processing is becoming increasingly important for us. And as Bharat and other speakers in the morning shared, AI model size are growing rapidly. And the graph here shows AI trend at meta, meta data center and shows that the AI inference demand is doubling every year. AI inference puts pressure on our compute system with 200 trillion predictions per day and 6 billion translations per day. So now the question is, how does Accelerator fit into our server and rack infrastructure? So schematic here shows Accelerator system level view where general purpose server infrastructure is shown in the left hand side of the slide and where multiple cpus are connected with each other through network this is a key piece of our infrastructure and section on the right shows how meta deployed accelerator where number of accelerators are fitted into m.2 or 12 m.2 factors plugged into existing data center or edge server platform these accelerators are connected through a pci switch and go into a card called glacier point v2 these GPV2 has similar power profile as Twin Lake, which are our CPU ways shown on the left. And this slide shows a component, whether it is a CPU, accelerator, or GPU journey to our rack. So CPU, GPU, or accelerator mounted on a module, which is shown in the leftmost image. Then these modules get integrated into a Glacier Point carrier card. Each carrier card has 12 modules which then integrated into a sled, which consists of four CPU for general purpose compute, or two CPU and two Glacier Point V2, which is then followed by 16 sleds integrating into a rack. And that's how the rack is formed, which is shown on the right-hand side of this slide. In this section, I will cover uh, some of the network power challenges and the opportunity and how uh, heterogeneous packaging is helping some of those. 
So as AI ML workload increasing in data center, machine to machine traffic is growing rapidly and bandwidth demand is increasing exponentially. However, power per bandwidth requirement is decreasing and the image on the right hand side shows networking is consuming a higher proportion of data center power budget over a period of time. And as we are aware of that power allocation in the data center is typically constrained. So if networking will consume more power in future, less power will be up available for some of the important func functions such as compute and storage. So power has become one of the biggest emerging challenges as we have seen even in the morning from some of the presentation and as Bharat and Catherine both pointed out. So where does this power get used? So this is a typical uh, top of the rack RSW switch at 100 gig studies where 50% power is being used for switching and 19% for optical link. But when we look at carefully, the IO between switch and optics accounts for roughly 20%, which are shown in the red and orange in this pie chart. By moving these two things closer, we can eliminate up to 20% and potentially up to 50% with the saving from retimer goes up as speed of electronics go up. So as Catherine shared earlier today, the evolution of uh, meta optical integration where we started with pluggable optics, moved to onboard optics, and now evaluating co-package optics. And so that, that way we are bringing more and more integration of optics and uh, switch ASIC. This is the schematic of a co-package system which has switch package or IC along with eight package of optical module in this picture. And it requires several te technology development and some of them are first in the industry for packaging, thermal and reliability. And some of the speaker today also covered some of them. So when both switch and optical package are mounted on a common subset, it will have either integrated laser as part of optical module or field serviceable laser. And there are several packaging challenges. Some of them are highlighted in this slide. So this co-package optics will be the largest package, almost 2x the largest package available in the market for AI, ML, or networking application. And currently, industry doesn't have such a large organic substrate. Uh, so we are looking into alternative options by which we can come up with such a large co-package optics solution. And since it will be a very large package, it will require special thermal management solution ranging from common lid across these several packages or maybe individual lid for each of these packages that followed by a common heat sink. Being a large package comes with a lot of thermomechanical challenges. So the warpage management of such a package will be a critical element. And since optical module will in include several dyes integration and we are exploring packaging technology ranging from 2.5D to 3D dye stacking. And in this case, switch will also bring some of the new business model either to get a switch IC or switch as a package, which can be eventually mounted on a substrate and create a co-package optics package. In addition, uh, some of the companies are also exploring switch IC as a chiplet packaging option. So industry momentum is building, but it is fragmented as can be seen in this uh, slide. There are several examples. The industry is rising to the challenge for co-package. How are these challenges is that all of them are proprietary. So the challenge is to drive a path to a standardized interoperable ecosystem, which enable optionality and allow mix and match between optics and switch silicon, as we do today with for pluggable optics switches. Now I will cover in the final part of my talk is how, what are some of the challenges we see for chiplet and what are some of the opportunity we see as chip for chiplets. So this slide shows some of the chiplet innovation happening in the industry where dye disaggregation into smaller chiplet is allowing to go beyond the full vertical size of the uh, silicon. The schematic on the left is showing a memory and compute disaggregation. And last year we had a public announcement by AMD where they have demonstrated using TSMC 3D SOIC technology, SRAM disaggregation over compute. The figure, in the schematic in the center shows disaggregation of compute chiplet uh, by allowing system level optimization of designing a system in which 
compute will go to the advanced node and memory and IO can uh, be in the lagging node. This approach is being already commercialized by AMD in their Epic chip and this delivers not only performance but at the same time opt optimize the cost by mixing the silicon node. The schematic on the right shows system level disaggregation where chiplets can be used to disaggregate between compute or compute and memory or memory to memory. And we have seen an example from Intel where disaggregation is proposed using silicon photonics chiplet along with compute and graphics chiplet. So to continue meta journey of developing an open ecosystem and addressing challenges related to slowing of Moore's law by enabling heterogeneous integration, Meta are actively driving development of chiplet marketplace in ODSA as part of OCP Workstream. And as you are aware of most of the chiplet based product are vertically integrated ecosystem currently, they don't, have, don't allow you to mix different functional silicon or silicon from different vendor. So ODSA is focusing on IO disaggregation, core disaggregation and system integration of chiplets. Here, I am showing some of the business challenges associated with chiplet, uh, which are categorized into four categories, cost reduction, fast innovation, operation, and standardization. From a cost reduction standpoint, we would like to use chiplet where we can reuse the silicon so that we don't have to go through the tape out and development cycle again and again. From an innovation standpoint, the key is, can we integrate third party IP or silicon into our existing silicon? And one of the biggest hurdle or barrier we see for chiplet standardization is die to die FI or interconnect uh, standards. Currently, most of the chiplet to chiplet interface are proprietary and ODSA and some of the other industry consortia are looking into developing more op open standardized die to die FI. Another key complex aspect of uh, chiplet is addressing the known good die because when you are doing a SOC disaggregation, who will own the overall system level yield, as well as the common security protocol across supply chain. So with that, I want to conclude my presentation and leave you with a final thought that what we believe or what I believe, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go further, go together. Great. Thanks very much, Ravi, for the overview of a few different areas uh, of the uh, meta infrastructure and use cases. Um, we had uh, we had one question from the from the audience here that, that came in. Um, again, it was from Chris. Chris, did you want to speak to that question directly? Okay. Um, yeah, just <clears throat> your architectural diagram that you shared showed the XSR interface. Uh, between the ASIC and the chiplet, if you compare that to a VSR interface, which you would have with a pluggable module, um, that's about a 10% power savings if you maintain the optics the same. Is that worth uh, such a large disruption to the paradigm? So Chris, I think you're referring for the co-package optics schematic, right? Yeah. So I think... Uh, we look at co-package optics, maybe not in a more longer term technology solution where it's not only first generation, maybe you between VSR and XSR, maybe benefit is not huge, but as, as the journey grows, we are looking at co-package optics is will provide not only power benefit as well as it will be uh, cheaper. Yeah, so there will be a cost optimization. I think I think maybe if I can chime in here, uh, Chris, as well. I think um, it depends what you're comparing to what, right? Because I mean, if you're comparing a purpose-built VSR interface to XSR, you're right; it's about ten percent. But as you know, in many cases, um, you know, because of generality of the Sodis technologies and reuse of IP blocks, you may not be using a purpose-built XSR interface on either the switch or on the optics phi. So I think, you know, as, as Ravi mentioned, this is a step along the road and, you know, the increased density, easier deployment, um, you know, and overall direction to bring optics close to silicon is kind of the direction that we're leading in this, in this area. Thank you. Yeah. 
And I've got another question from the chat, Ravi. Um, the question is, you mentioned 2X the largest package size today. Are you talking about greater than 150 by 150 millimeters? Uh, so uh, there are a lot of presentation has been shared by ecosystem partner in YF. And yes, uh, some of them are going all the way to 150 by 150 and uh, larger. Okay, so you believe you believe uh, you know packages of that size are you know kind of emerging and maybe um, within within uh, within sight. No, I think the question was uh, in my presentation was I referring 150 by 150 as a size which I'm referring as 2x. Oh right, yep. Uh, okay. Did I get the question right? Yes, you did. Yeah, thanks yeah. for clarifying. So yeah, so uh, so uh, yes, answer is it could be 150 by 150 or higher, and as I said. There is a lot of uh, data has been shared in OIF uh, where uh, you know ecosystem partner has shared how, what kind of substrate sizes they are working on. Right. Thanks very much, Ravi. Thanks very much for your presentation. Thanks, Rob.